Next, Mr. the Confessor. <clears throat> I've already talked a little bit about his um, life, and because after today, we've only got two more days of class that we'll meet. Um, I'm going to try and cover everything that I've assigned to be read today on him. The one thing I think I'm going to skip. Um, I think it's the one thing. Is the Ad Thalassium 64 on the prophet Jonah and the economy of salvation. Um, unless you guys have questions about it, but we'll, we'll kind of go quickly through these other things, beginning with Ad Thalassium uh, in On the Cosmic Mystery of Christ. <coughs> so, he begins. And notice how these all begin. They begin with a question, okay? If, as St. John says, he who is born of God does not sin because his seed dwells in God, and he cannot sin, and yet he who is born of water and spirit is himself born of God, and he's got a couple of biblical um, citations there, then how are we who are born of God through baptism still able to sin? I mean, that's a pretty rational question. People still ask it today. We're told, Christians are told, be you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is on page 103. Okay. Um, be you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And yet St. Paul says... The thing I will to do, I don't do. The thing I don't will to do, I do. And he talks about the war between the flesh and the spirit. Okay? So, Maximus replies, The manner of birth from God within us is twofold. That is, we are born slash created. We, after Adam. This is going to be a very important distinction. Um... In two ways, entirely present in potency in those who are born of God, the other introduces wholly by active exertion that grace which deliberately reorients the entire free choice of the one being born of God toward the God who gives birth. So what does he mean by that? He talks about one being potency and one being an active exertion of the will. He's saying, in potency, he says, we have within, everyone has within the potentiality, okay, of what? The grace of adoption. Everybody, everybody is born with that, he is suggesting, okay? But that's only, that's only a potentiality. That's only a seed, as with every other seed, what must be done with that seed? It must be nurtured. Okay, That's what he's talking about with active exertion. That is, that seed of potentiality has got to be properly nourished. How is that potentiality nourished? By an active exertion of the will or choice. So, the first, okay, the potentiality of the grace of adoption... The first bears the grace, present in potency, through faith alone. Okay, it's not through works, it's through faith alone. The second, beyond faith, that is, it goes beyond faith, what? Also engenders in the knower the sublimely divine likeness of the one known. Notice, it engenders in the knower, the person who's doing the knowing, <coughs> what do they know? The sublimely divine likeness of the one known. Why? That likeness being affected precisely through knowledge. Therefore, the first manner of birth is observed in some because their will, not yet fully detached from its propensity to the flesh, is yet to be wholly endowed with the spirit, by participation in the divine mysteries that are made known through active endeavor. Okay, so what does he mean by that? He says that first manner of birth, the grace of adoption, right, is observed in some. We can witness it, he is suggesting, in people. Why? Because that manner of birth hasn't been 
detached from its propensity to the flesh, but it has yet, he says, to be wholly endowed with the spirit, that is, to be wholly um, nourished, nurtured with the spirit. How? By participation in the divine mysteries. The divine mysteries, that's a technical term, okay? The technical term, the divine mysteries, is referring to what in the West gets called the sacrament of the church, or the sacraments of the church, okay? The inclination to sin does not disappear, notice, as long as they will it. So what must one do to stop the inclination to sin? Yeah. You must will not to sin. That's what it comes down to. Okay? So he is saying everyone who has been baptized and has received the grace of of the Holy Spirit, and yet still sins, they sin because they choose to, because they will to, all right? So, for the Spirit does not give birth to an unwilling will. That is, because they're baptized, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit takes over their will and takes it from them. Because if that happens, what occurs with human responsibility. It gets thrown out the window. We have no responsibility if freedom of will is taken. So, he says, but converts, that is, the Holy Spirit in baptism, converts the willing will toward deification. Okay? Now, what does he mean by the willing will? And this is where Maximus gets um, kind of thorny, kind of difficult. Maximus the Confessor <laughs> will argue, and in, in, if you read the footnotes in all of this and the introduction, um, you, we see this idea earlier even than Maximus the Confessor, argues that there are two wills in everyone. Okay? That there is a natural will, and he says that the natural will is this will that is created when everyone is created, and it is created because of humans being made in the image of God. Okay, And so the natural will that is part of being made in the image of God does what? It naturally inclines towards God. That is, it naturally chooses God. It wants to essentially return to God. Not return in the sense, however, that the soul or the will pre-existed before. Okay? But return in the sense that this natural will recognizes what it was first created for. And that was union with God. Okay? That's, that's one part of the will. This other part is what he calls, what gets translated as, the gnomic will. Okay? And it doesn't mean gnomic like we use the word gnomic in, in literary studies to refer to a proverb or a statement or a sentence of wisdom. Gnomic here, um, gnomic here means this will, this other kind of will in us that is predisposed okay, to I don't want to say predisposed to sin predisposed to choice okay, the natural will of grace essentially, because of being made in the image of God that's not a choosing will that's just, you know, it's like the natural inclination of a flower to do what? How do, how do flowers grow, though? Towards the, sun. Towards the sun. Its natural inclination is to face the sun. Okay? He, the same kind of image applies to this natural will in man. It 
turns, faces the, quote, S-O-N, let's say, all right? This other will, that the appetitive will, the choosing will, okay, doesn't have that same kind of natural inclination or the gnomic will, okay? This is the choosing will. And what he argues is that after the fall, okay, subsequent to Adam and Eve's creation, when Cain and Abel were produced, that's when this gnomic will really enters. Okay? And it's, I don't want to say it's a product of sin, because he, we, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. Now let me stop there and just go on to what else he says. Okay? The willing will, okay, let me back up. The spirit does not give birth to an unwilling will, but converts the willing will. This is the gnomic will. The will to choose, the ability to choose. But it converts that will, he says, toward deification. Because again, the natural will, that's its already its, its aim, is deification, is unification with God. Therefore, whoever has participated in this deification through cognizant experience is incapable of reverting from right discernment in truth. Once he has achieved this in action to something else besides which only pretends to be that same discernment. So let's unpack that. Whoever has participated in this deification, what does he mean? Choosing okay, to follow that grace of adoption. Choosing to unite this will, the gnomic will, okay, with the natural will to be united to God he says, is incapable of reverting from right discernment in truth. And I think what he means there, and I could be wrong, okay? I could be really, really wrong. I think what he means there is once you've tasted that deification, you cannot choose to go back. Why? Because this gnomic will then becomes totally united with that natural will. And it realizes, this is what I was made for. In other words, it, it finds that desire that it's been seeking. And it realize, realizes, this is the fulfillment of everything. There's no turning aside. Okay? Is it kind of like in Hebrews 8 when it says, like, a warning against those who fall away, like, once you, because that part's kind of always confused me, because it's like, once you fall away, you can never come back, kind of thing. I don't know. Um, if you, and, you know, is it like, if you truly tasted it, it's, I guess I would say possibly, but I think that passage in Hebrews 8, um, that's not as much getting at the idea that he's addressing here of deification, of, of, once, of once you've fully experienced God. Okay. Um, you know, an example. Um, Moses. Goes, on, goes up Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, two names for the same mountain. Goes up on Mount Sinai, has this experience of God. Wouldn't, I mean, just rationally speaking, leave, you know, in one sense, leave theology and all that aside for a moment. Just on the basis of common sense. If you had that experience, would you, would you ever be the same? I mean, would anybody in here if you ever really, physically, with your own two eyes, saw um, Gabriel, the archangel, would you ever be the same? Probably not. Similarly, let's you know drop it down a few levels. Use you know more popular imagination stuff. If you ever really, physically saw a ghost. Would you ever be the same? Or a demon? 
would you, and I don't mean, you know, Hollywood, I mean, assuming that you accept that these things are real, and you really, I don't think anybody would kind of go back to their life the way it once was before, okay? I mean, the whole purpose Dante writes, for example, the Divine Comedy, and of his journeys through hell, purgatory, and heaven, is to essentially say, I, I can't go back to how I lived before. I it's beyond me. It's impossible. Why? Because within the context of the poem, he's seen what happens in hell. Okay, so if you've seen what happens in hell, if you've seen hell as a reality, you kind of think that would make you want to change how you lived, maybe. Okay? So he goes on. Caroline, you had a question. Yeah, I, was just, I know that we're talking about deification, but you mentioned in another class about how um, the angels have a choice, and then once you've made that choice, there's no going back. It's just, it's just kind of similar. <laughs> yeah, but I think, that's for, I think that's only for the angelic orders. Yeah. Um, and again, I could be wrong about that. Um... So, in fact, he uses this example. It's like the eye which, once it has looked upon the sun, cannot mistake it for the moon or any of the other stars in the heavens. Um, Augustine says in his Confessions that everybody, everybody is seeking God. Richard Dawkins, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, the most avowed atheists there are, are seeking God. They're seeking not the theolo theological concept God. They are seeking the real God. Now, Augustine would say they're seeking it in the wrong places, but they're still seeking. They're still looking. Okay, They're trying to find it you know, out there. Um, Einstein said he was seeking the mind of God in trying to figure out how everything works. Because he thought, if you could figure out that, then you would understand how God thinks. Okay? Even though Einstein was also, he was pretty close to an atheist. But he said, there's something, there's some principle that organizes everything. Okay? So, what's Maximus saying? If you've ever seen the sun... You can never confuse it for a fluorescent bulb, or a light bulb, or a flame, or anything else. Similarly, if you've ever seen God, or tasted, or experienced God, you can never confuse that experience with anything else. So, he says, those undergoing the second mode of birth, that is, the transformation of that appetitive or gnomic will, the Holy Spirit does what? Takes the whole of their free choice and translates it completely from earth to heaven. Okay? The second mode of birth, sorry, you know, grace of baptism. And through the true knowledge acquired by exertion, what does that mean? The true knowledge acquired by exertion. You've got two roads before you. What did Robert Frost say? The road less traveled. You got to choose one. Okay. The, the exertion, the true knowledge acquired by exertion is that choosing the good, choosing to follow one path, the right path, through the true knowledge acquired by exertion, transfigures the mind with the blessed light rays of our God and Father such that the mind is deemed another, notice, lowercase God, insofar as, its habit, uh, insofar as in its habitude it experiences by grace that which God himself does not experience, but is in his very essence. So what does he mean by all that? I think partly what he means is that what happens once you start to make choices? Use that example that I, I mentioned before of um, Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. What happens when you meet, you know, a fork in the road? 
and you take the right hand and you don't take the left hand. So you now go off down this direction and what eventually will happen there? You'll meet another fork in the road. And what do you do? You take one side and you keep going, okay? That kind of implies, however, that it's haphazard. That, you know, you just say, man, I'll take this one or I'll take this one. What Maximus is suggesting is if you are intentionally, okay, choosing a virtue or a virtuous course of action, if you are intentionally choosing to, quote unquote, do good, what does that do to this will? Okay, what else? Think of it in a um, an athletic context or a musical context, like learning to play a flute. Okay, keep going. What do you have to do to become a concert flautist? you know, or to become a champion dancer. You don't just go out first time and, you know, nail it. It takes practice. Because what are you doing in practicing? So that it comes easier. You're removing what? Flaws. Okay? You're filing off rough edges. You're polishing yourself. So the more and more and more you choose, quote unquote, the good, the easier and easier and easier it becomes to choose the good. And the longer and longer and longer and longer you choose the good, what? The farther and farther and farther away you get from the not good. Okay? So, um, with those undergoing the second mode of baptism, that is, aligning their will to what has happened at the grace of baptism, um, lost my place, their free choice clearly becomes sinless in virtue and knowledge as they are unable to negate what they have actively discerned through experience. Okay? Because they've aligned themselves to what they received in the grace of baptism, he says, it becomes harder to quote-unquote sin. But notice what that takes. Choice. But it also means a conscious choice or decision after baptism, to realize at this moment, okay, and this is especially more so for people who are baptized as adults than it obviously is for a baby baptized at eight days or four weeks old or whatever the amount of time. Um, so even if we have the spirit of adoption, he who is himself the seed for enduing those begotten through baptism with the likeness of the sower, okay, talking about the Spirit, but do not present him with a will cleansed of any inclination or disposition to something else. We, therefore, even after being born of water and Spirit, what? Willingly sin. So this is his resp response. Why do people still sin after baptism? Because they choose to. It's not because they're unable to not sin. He says, everyone is able, and he means this literally, to come up out of the water of baptism and never sin again. Okay? Why do they? Because they choose to. Because they haven't worked on directing their will. Okay? towards God, which kind of then, um, just one second, let me introduce the next one and then we'll come back to your question, which kind of then naturally leads to that next section on spiritual progress in virtue. Chris? Many is probably love here, right? 
Um, yes and no, I would think. Um, yes, because of the emphasis on free will. But probably no, because of other things that Maximus writes, in, in terms of talking about how corrupt people are. Um, because I'm going to use the, the extreme. Because the extreme Armenians would say um, that it really doesn't have to be that difficult. Okay, And I think Maximus would say, no, it, it is. It is, because... We, we, after the fall, are born with this inclination. And I think a really extreme Armenian would say, well, no, it's not an inclination as much as it's almost more of a mistake. Okay, so he does believe that sin is something that we automatically... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which we'll see um, a little bit later on. Was there another... Okay. On spiritual spiritual progress in virtue. And this the the stepping off point for this seems really odd. You know, this little passage from Exodus talking about um, why Moses didn't circumcise their young son and thereby incurred the wrath of, you know, God, etc. And notice how he quickly dispenses with part of the problem of that passage, okay? Whoever intelligently examines the enigmas of the scriptures, what? With a fear of God, and for the sake of the divine glory alone, that is, what he means there is, if you read the scriptures with one, the fear of God in mind, that is, you don't pick up the Bible and read it <clears throat> like you pick up any other book and read it simply because it's not like any other book, okay? And two, reads it for the sake of the divine glory alone, rather than reads it to try to figure out, you know, uh, what does science say about the creation of the world, okay? Reading, in other words, the Bible like a textbook, because it's not a textbook. So he goes on, and removes the letter as though it were a curtain around the spirit, meaning removes the letter of the text, meaning the actual literal words, as doing what? They're covering up the spirit or the real meaning. And what he's talking about here are two different approaches to scripture. Obviously, a literalist approach and an allegorical approach. Okay, there are actually four different, um, the fathers of the church, all the way up to Dante, talk about four different kinds of interpretation. One, literal. That is, what does it say just on the surface level of the words? Okay. Um, two, allegorical. Three, anagogical. And then four, mystagogical. Mystagogical referring to the mysteries of... Um, God, as it were, okay? So he says, you've got to look beyond, right? No impediment will be found to the perfect motion of the mind toward divine things. That is, if you read the way I'm talking about. So he says, let's let stand the literal meaning. Why? <coughs> because the literal meaning was literally true for Moses, at the time when Moses did or did not do what he was supposed to do or wasn't supposed to do. So that part was fulfilled back in Moses' day. So what do we now need to do? Now we need to consider, just one second, we spiritualize the power of the literal meaning in the spirit. That is, take that literal meaning Okay, of an angel of God coming to Moses saying, you didn't circumcise your son, blah, 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 blah. And understand that in the spirit, 
since this power is constantly being realized and abounding into its fullness. Yes, oh, Hillary. I'm sorry, what page? Uh, 105. So, where was Moses in this passage? Where was Moses going? He's going from the desert to somewhere else. So he says, the desert that Moses was leading, moving from, represents, notice, he's allegorizing. The desert, yes, literally, it's the real desert that Moses was in. But it represents either human nature, or this world, or that habitude of the soul, which has been ridded of the passions. Okay? So, literally, the desert is a desert. Symbolically, or allegorically, the desert is either human nature, the world, or the soul that has been rid of passions. So the mind, who is subsisting in that habitude and dwelling in this world, okay, the mind, therefore, is the allegorical reading of Moses inhabiting the desert. The mind is instructed in true knowledge through the contemplation of created beings, receives a hidden and mystical commission from by the angel, to what? To lead out of the Egypt of the heart. Okay? That is, from the realm of flesh and sense, divine thoughts of created beings in the man of the Israelites. So, Moses was called to lead the children out of Egypt. So what does that mean? Allegorically. Moses, the mind is called to lead the children, the thoughts, out of the Egypt of the heart. Lead them where? To God. Okay. Okay, so where would you want this to actually circumcise the Right. So how would that work? How would that work? I don't know. Let's see if he addresses that. Okay. Because what is, what's going on here? The mind, who remains the passage within the dashes, invariably travels in a holy way of life, the road of the virtues. Okay? So the mind, throughout life, does what? Travels the road of the virtues, a road that in no way admits of any stalling on the part of those who walk in it. Go back for a minute. Um... <coughs> So what's he talking about? If Moses had stopped on the way, what is he saying would have happened? Okay. If the way is this, this road of virtues, and what is a road for? What's the purpose of a road or a path? To be traveling on. Is the road the place you stop? <coughs> no. Road is meant for, for movement, okay? So he's saying is if you're on this road or this path of virtue and you stop, what's going to happen? The virtuous behavior stops, okay? He's implying that one virtue does what? It leads to the next, which leads to the next which leads to the next, which leads to the next, and you stop. It means you don't reach the next. It's the stopping in quote-unquote mid-virtue, he's going to suggest, is what allows vice to occur. For the immobility of virtue is the beginning of vice. The immobility, the lack of what kind of movement? Virtuous movement is always forward. It's always progressing. Okay? Well, if you're not progressing, what are you? Progressing. You're stagnant. Water that doesn't move becomes what? Stagnant. Okay? So, 
one spiritually envisions the reproving word of God forthwith as an angel doing what? Threatening death in the conscience. And that doesn't mean, I don't think necessarily, physical death. It's spiritual death. It's, you better change and testifying that the reason for this threat is immobility and virtue. That is, if you don't start moving, you will die. Such as also causes the uncircumcision of mental reflection. Okay, so he's talking about not a physical circumcision, a mental one. Okay, skip a little bit. Well, let me because this might get to Caroline's thing. The wisdom that dwells within, with the mind wins over its recollect, reflection, and in the manner of Zipporah, uses the small stone of the word of faith to circumcise the material illusion that arises in the little boy. What's the little boy? The mental reflection. So, the word of God becomes what? As St. Paul will say, a sharp two-edged sword that cuts to the bones and in, in marrow. Okay, what's it cutting? It's removing something, and to eliminate any thought of sensual life. For Zipporah said, the blood of the boy's circum uh, circumcision has been instituted, which is to say, and now he allegorizes the passion-laden life and illusion and motion of the soul abate. That is, they recede. Once the defiled reflection of the mind, okay, the defiled thought of the mind has been purified with the wisdom of faith. The wisdom of faith, the purification, is the circumcision, the removing of that defilement of thought. Okay, so what is he saying? How do you remove the defilement of thought? With, go back to the earlier paragraph, the beginning of the paragraph, the reproving word of God. Okay. This is one of the reasons, as an example, why monks um, you know, will read through the entire Psalter every week. Okay. Because what does that do? It replaces other thoughts in the mind. I mean, there's a there's an actual canon in um, <clears throat> came out of I think it was the Seventh Ecumenical Council. <clears throat> it said, in order for a man to be ordained a bishop, this was a new canon instituted in 787. In order for a man to be ordained a bishop, he has to memorize the Psalter. That is, he's got to memorize all 151 Psalms, all of them. Word for word, beginning to end. And, and the implication of what that means is that at any point, somebody could say, Your Grace, tell me. <laughs> and he ought to be able to on the spot. Okay. The Psalms is, in, in one sense, the book par excellence of the Old Testament. It's poetry. It's history. It's theology, it's prophecy, it's everything, okay, in there. And the idea is you fill your mind with what? Good things rather than, that's right, we don't have one, you know, the idiot box, okay? Be because what do we know happens with the human mind? I mean, cognitive scientists are really now starting to, to emphasize this. Every experience you've had is stored. Everything you've read, everything you've seen is stored. All they have to do is cut your head open, pull out a little, you know, electric probe, and just start touching the right spots. And if you're alert, because I've done this, say exactly what's going on when they hit that spot. You know, a memory from three years old. And the person, you know, tells the memory perfectly, okay? It's kind of scary when you think about it. If you, I mean, I'm 52. I've seen an awful lot of stuff, meaning junk, 
that I would just soon, you know, be able to take a magnet and, go and erase it if I could, free up some, you know, space in my hard drive, so to speak. But apparently our hard drives are expandable. <laughs> so, therewith the word of God, like an angel, smites the errant mind through the conscience and frustrates every emerging thought, save that which properly befits it. And this is why the fathers will say, read, but not read anything. Okay? Read the scriptures. Read the lives of saints. Read uh, holy books. And by holy books, they mean lives of the saints, writings of the fathers. Okay? And, and a lot of these folks wrote poetry. Ephraim the Syrian. Almost everything he wrote was poetry. Okay? Isaac the Syrian wrote poetry. Homilies. Gregory of Nazianzus wrote poetry. Gregory of Nyssa wrote poetry. Okay? Why? Because they realize, you know, a lot of people don't like sitting down reading pure, dry, dead theology. Okay? Horace was right, first century Roman poet. Horace was right. Purpose of literature is what? It's not only to teach, it's to delight also. Okay? So, for the way of virtues is in truth filled with many holy angels who can effect every specific virtue. Caroline. Okay, I'm still confused about Sephora. I get the reflection, I get the stones, but I do. I'm so busy on this second side. No, that's okay. What does she exactly represent? That's where I'm at. <clears throat> um, uh, I don't know unless he would say because I don't think he does address it unless he would say you know she represents the movement of the spirit possibly okay, so but he doesn't say it because I'm not missing no he I, I don't think he does actually literally say in here um, unless it's in a footnote but I don't think he does. Okay. Okay. Therefore, next paragraph on 107. Therefore, the word of Holy Scripture <laughs> remains good and noble, always offering spiritual truth in place of the literal for those who lay hold of it, saving meaning. Notice, with the eyes of the soul. Okay. So one of the benefits of reading, he would argue, Scripture, is because it it puts the words in the soul that the soul can then go back to okay, and, and kind of, um, you know, like you make tea. You get the leaves and you pour water over it. Well, the scripture in this sense would be like the leaves and the water would be the work of the spirit that enables one to then gradually grow a deeper and deeper understanding. You know, I'm sure some of you, especially being most of you English majors, um, I'm sure some of you, you know, have favorite books that you've read more than once. You know, I teach a course on, on Tolkien and Rowling. Um, I've read The Lord of the Rings, I don't know, 30 times probably. I've read Rowling probably, oh, 10 or 15 times. I teach it every other summer in London. Right? Every time I read Rowling's novels and I read The Lord of the Rings, more comes out. Okay? He's saying the same thing about Scripture here. The more you read it, what? The more you see. It's like an onion. You just peel back layer after layer after layer. Okay? For according to the spiritual sense of this text, skip this on as and he's going back to the literal meaning, and he says this is the spiritual meaning of it. Okay. Um, okay, let's go on. I'm going to skip the last thing I was going to talk about there. Uh, go on to the next one, Ad Thalassium 21, on Christ's conquest of the human passions, unless you have a question about the previous one. So, the question is, what is the meaning of the scripture... Quote, 
He put off the powers and principalities, unquote, and so on from Colossians 2.15. And how indeed had he, quote, put them on, unquote, by Christ? How did Christ put off the powers and principalities, the question is, if he never put them on? Because the idea was that he wouldn't have put them on if he was begotten without sin. The powers and principalities referring it to sinful nature. The divine logos assumed our human nature without altering his divinity. That is, when he assumed humanity, he didn't somehow, the divine logos, he didn't somehow become tainted with sin. Okay? <coughs> Why? Because West. Why? Why East? Okay, there is a true North. I mean, a, a direct North. And there is a true South. There is not a true East and West. East and West are relative. Because what happens? You go far enough East, and what does it become? West. You go far enough North, you go past North, and then head south. But if you just keep going east, you'll just keep going in circles, and you will never pass west. You just keep going east. Whereas if you go north, you do go past zero. Okay? So, he became and became perfect man in every way like us, save without sin. And he's referring to Hebrews 4.15 there. So this is what all that means. He appeared like the first man, Adam, in the manner both of his creaturely origin and his birth. Okay? The first man, Adam, and bear in mind, what does the word Adam mean? Red. Okay? And it's a reference to the redness of the earth, the dirt. It's all it means. Okay? Very, well, I don't want to say that. Some of the fathers say, you know, the whole story of Adam is just a myth. It's just a story. It's just a story to talk about the creation of how we became the way we are. Okay. Very few of them actually read it the way a modern fundamentalist would as literal. There was a man named Adam and he had a wife named Eve. And God created everything in six literal 24-hour um, days. I was just listening to something yesterday. The word, the word in the Hebrew Bible that is translated day in modern English doesn't literally mean day. It means act. Okay. The evening and the morning were the first act of God. And the evening and the morning were the second act of God. Okay. Anyways, it's off the point. So, he appeared like the first Adam, how? In his creaturely origin and his birth. So what does that mean? The first man received his existence from God and came into being at the very origin of his existence. He's being very specific there because he's still thinking of the Origenists, the followers, or followers of Origen, who said, oh, we have this pre-existence of the soul. Our souls dwelt with God before we were brought down here. He's, no. He's saying, Adam came into existence at the very moment when God said, let us make man in our image. There wasn't a soul of Adam dwelling with God before then. Okay? But what else? He was free from corruption and sin. So at the moment when God created Adam, he was, in that sense, perfect. But only in the sense of being free from corruption and sin. He wasn't perfect in the sense of being totally complete. Right? But, when Adam sinned, by breaking God's commandment, he was condemned to birth based on sexual passion and sin. Now, what Maximus means there is, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, okay, the future of humanity would have begun, uh, not, take that back, not the future of humanity, subsequent humanity. Procreation would have occurred differently. Differently? How? I'm not exactly sure. Here's my guess. Okay? It wouldn't have occurred based on sexual passion. Okay? I don't mean there wouldn't have been sexual intercourse. 
I mean, there wouldn't have been sexual passion. The word passion is pretty important in um, Maximus. He's going to use, I think in this section and some of the later ones, the word passability. Passability means um, changeableness. Okay, Changeableness really in emotions like anger, fear, love, hatred, disgust, joy, because each of those implies what? It's, a, you know, if you think of an emotional state as being a flat line, okay, where you have no emotions. Um, think Harry Potter for a moment. When someone is put under an imperious curse, you have that scene in, in um, the fourth book when Harry's put under the imperious curse by the false Mad-Eye Moody. And what are we told Harry experiences? Anybody remember, for those who have read it? Bliss. He doesn't experience, really, anything. No will, no desire, no sense of self. It's just calm. Okay? So what are the passions then, therefore, when you have that state of calm? It's a movement either up or down. Joy would be up. Fear and anger would be down. Okay? It's this kind of thing, in other words. So what he's talking about is in the garden, before sin, Adam and Eve were like this. Perfect peace. Total contentment or satisfaction. And it's only after sin that you begin to see the ups and downs of life. So, what does that mean? I think when in talking about condemned to birth based on sexual passion and sin, meaning sexual, let's use a modern term that might be better than passion, lust, desire, okay? Accordingly, there is no human being who is sinless. Why? Because everybody outside the garden is born as a result of that. David says in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. He's not saying, oh, it's because of my mother. It's women's fault. It's not what he means. Okay? What he means by that is, through, according to Maximus, I'm reading that passage of Psalms in light of what Maximus is saying here. Okay? In sexual passion, did my mother conceive me? Okay. Since everyone is naturally subject to the law of sexual procreation that was introduced after man's true creaturely origin in consequence of his sin. So the sexual procreation of humanity is, Maximus is saying, a consequence of sin. Yes, Caitlin. So is he saying that, like, I don't know, like, is he condemning sexual relations within, like, marriage? Or is he, I mean, because, I don't know, that just seems kind of tricky to think of when you're... Yeah, it is. You're condemned, like, no I mean, matter what. It, it is tricky. Um, St. Augustine, who's before Maximus, takes this kind of line of thought to an extreme and says it's the actual sexual act that is sinful. Okay. So that that idea then gets skewed in the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church so that the Catholic Church says, yeah, if you're going to burn with sexual passion, then you ought to get married. If you get married, there's only one reason to do it. It's to have children. If you're going to have sex to have children, don't enjoy the act of sexual intercourse. What? That's kind of, you know, impossible unless you're talking rape or some something weird, okay? Um, but there are, there are other writers, other fathers of the church, uh, Ephraim the Syrian, for example, who essentially says the most blessed state is virginity. And even if you marry to live in virginity, that is, to be married but to never consummate the marriage. 
That's not, however, um, the majority or consensus view in, in terms of the fathers of the church. Okay, so he goes on. Since therefore sin came about on account of the transgression, that is Adam's transgression, and the liability to passions connected with sexual procreation entered human nature on account of sin. Okay, the liability, the propensity to passions, he says, comes into us through the very way that we are created. Okay, through sex. And since through sin, the original transgression continued unabatedly to flourish right along with this passability of childbirth, passability, this changeable state, there was no hope of liberation. Why? For human nature was deliberately and indissolubly bound by the chain of evil. And he's going to go on and say, and so what did people do? They tried to overcome it. By what? Having more children. But you have more children and what happens? The binding gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Okay? That's why he says there's only one way that we could be removed from this passability, this endurance or suffering of the passions. Um, I'm going to skip that part. P top of 111. Taking on the original condition of Adam, Adam, as he was in the very beginning, he's talking about Christ here, Okay. Taking on the original condition of Adam as he was in the very beginning, he was sinless, but not incorruptible. Well, how was he sinless? What did not happen for the conception of the man Jesus? There's no sex involved. Okay? The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, Gabriel tells Mary, and he that is conceived of you shall be called the Son of the Most High. Okay? So he was sinless, but not incorruptible. Meaning, the body, there's a footnote in here somewhere, okay, was not incorruptible. And also meaning, Christ could have been corrupted. You know, the temptation by the devil in the wilderness the, the, all the fathers of the church say, was not a sham. It was not merely, you know, Jesus going through the motion. Of, okay, Satan, go ahead, come on. Yeah, tempt me. You know, flicks him away because he can't be tempted. No, it's because he could be tempted. Okay, um, Caitlin, you had your hand up first and then... Um, I, this might be kind of off topic, but I just wondering, like, you know, what the shadow of the Most High will overshadow you. I have no idea what that means. Does anybody? Uh, yeah, it's the movement of the Holy Spirit. That's the shadow of the Most High into you. Where do you see the shadow of the Most High? Well, look in the Old Testament. You know, what does Moses see when he first looks up on Mount Sinai? A cloud. Okay, the Shekinah glory that is later referred to, because God can't be seen. Okay. He all he you know what happens on Mount Tabor in the Transfiguration. It's there's a cloud again, and a light. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, I was uh, just going to connect this to Basil. Basil also made that point about Jesus's conception that it wasn't through sex, and that's the uh, reason why he is sinless. And yeah. That's that's why you know. Um, and a virgin shall conceive, Isaiah writes. Okay, That's why it's so important that, that he's not born the same way. If he'd been born the same way, okay, if he was, you know, for example, as um, some of the, the um, apocryphal gospels say, if Jesus was born the same way as any other man and merely became the Son of God at the baptism, that is, the divine Logos enters him then. Then, according to St. Paul, for example, and then all the subsequent fathers of the church wouldn't have, wouldn't have done any good. Because why? Because he would not have totally 
completely, fully assumed human nature. He had to be totally, fully, completely human. Okay? And that's why Mary's role becomes so important. Because through Mary, he receives all of humanity. Okay? Which is what Basil was talking about also. Um, so he was uh, sinless but not incorruptible, and he assumed from the procreative process introduced into human nature as a consequence of sin only the liability to passions. That is, because he receives real human nature. He, he's not a illusion like the docetists claimed. Okay? This is why it's important, you know, after the resurrection, when he sees the disciples, he says, come on guys, feel me, touch me, I'm real. Thomas, put your finger through my hand. Because Thomas said, unless I put my finger through his hand and my hand in his side, I, he doesn't say cannot believe. He says, I will not believe. And Jesus says, come on, because he wants him to believe. Okay. But what he's doing there is he's showing, this is real human nature, all right, or human flesh. But notice, he's only born with the liability to passions. That is, he could have suffered passions. Since then, through the liability to passions that resulted from Adam's sin, the evil powers, as I already said, have hidden their activities clandestinely under the law of human nature in its cir current circumstance. It merely follows that these wicked powers, skip the big long passage into uh, hyphens, they assailed him. Therefore, to get back at the original question, this is how he put off those powers and principalities. Okay? He put them on only in potentiality. Only in that, as St. Paul says, he was tempted in every way like as we are. Now, I think Maximus would say with that passage, um, what does that mean? Well, let's look at it on its literal level and then let's go allegorically. Literal level that means whatever way each of you has been sent, has been tempted, and I have been tempted, he was tempted the same. But flip that. What else does it mean? Based upon what Basil said earlier and what Maximus says in this and some of the following pieces. By the very fact that he took on human nature, what does that mean? He took on all human temptations from the beginning to the end, okay? Because they're all bound up with human beingness. Everybody, in other words, in, in this sense, has been tempted like that. In other words, you know, Taylor's temptations aren't different than Caitlin's. Yeah, they, there might be different people involved kind of thing. But the temptation itself, no, pretty much been there, done that. In the Orthodox Church, um, confession is a, is a regular part. And, you know, confession can be tricky, especially if you're newly Orthodox. But most churches kind of make it easy. They give you a prayer to read. Sometimes the prayer is short, you know, 40, 50 words. Um, but there have been priests and abbots and bishops in the past who have tried to come up with rules of confession that make it pretty complete so that you can go up and you, you know, say some other things and then you read through this entire prayer. It pretty much covers everything. Anything that you can think of. Yep. And the reason that's done is because you're trying to essentially cover all the bases. But even after you read all of that, the priest will stop you at one point and say, now, is there any specific? In other words, you know, these are generalizations. And so the priest says, okay, now, is there anything specific you'd like to confess? Like, you know, have you stolen anything? Have you lusted after anybody? Have you lied to anybody? Are you, you know angry at God for, you know, the car accident or your car not start, whatever the thing may be, right? 
Um, because we're running out of time, I was going to cover more there, but we're going to skip the rest of that. Um, Christ in the end of the ages. The question is, if in the coming ages God will show us riches, how is it that the end of the ages has already come upon us? Okay. And if anybody remembers, how does Maximus essentially answer that? He says those two end of the ages refer to two different things. The end of the ages has come upon us how? God has entered human history. J.R.R. Tolkien in his essay on fairy stories says that is, it's the one story everybody would want more than anything else to be true. And therefore, because it's the one story everybody else would want more than anything else to be true, it must be true. He calls it, the myth became fact. Okay? So, he says the end of the ages has come because God entered human history in the person of Christ. And in that sense, yeah, we are in the quote-unquote end times. So what's the other end of the ages? It's when the times that we are now in will what? Reach their conclusion. Okay, When Christ says on the cross, his very last words, it is finished. It doesn't mean that what we are all now living is, you know, some kind of dream in the mind of God. He means the whole purpose and plan. Yes, I know. The whole purpose and plan done, complete. Now it's we're just waiting for the denouement. The climax has been achieved, if you're thinking of this as a story. Okay. Now we're just waiting for the unraveling of the action and everything else. Um, to occur. Okay, I might on Tuesday, because Tuesday we start um, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. I might just say a few words on that um, on the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ, you know, which is the title of the book. Um, before we jump into that, if you have any other questions about the other parts in here, I wanted to talk about the two wills of Christ in Gethsemane, but we ran out of time. Okay. Let me see.